Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Roofing Contractor Walls and Ceilings Legal Insights. I'm RC Editor Art Eisner, and I appreciate you being here, whether it's by video or by podcast. Joining me, as usual, is Trent Cotney of Adams & Reese. Trent, as always, uh, I'm glad you're here to walk us through some of the big legal issues uh, and otherwise uh, affecting the industry. How are you doing? Doing great, Art. It's good to see you. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Well, uh, much of the country is trying to get to spring, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, if it weren't, uh, it wouldn't be spring really if we weren't talking about preparing for OSHA. Uh, uh, the feds uh, recently made some news on roofingcontractor.com with their asbestos ruling uh, in relation to the Toxic Substances Control Act. That's a, a lot to get out. Uh, Trent, what's the significance for roofers on that? Yeah, so uh, one of the interesting things that, that we're seeing with EPA is a lot of this rulemaking as it relates to, you know, hazardous chemicals and toxic substances. And um, among that is uh, asbestos. Um, in particular, they were focusing on the crystalline type asbestos that uh, is still being placed in products primarily overseas and being shipped here for construction purposes. Um, what's interesting in this rulemaking that they're doing, though, is, is what happens to asbestos that is otherwise rendered inert or is naturally occurring. I mean, it's a naturally occurring mineral, and you're going to get trace amounts in a variety of different products, um, you know, usually silica type based products. So, you know, how this is ultimately going to play out and to what extent they're going to be uh, really putting pen to paper on the amount of asbestos that can be present naturally occurring is going to be interesting. One of the other things that that I thought um, is probably worth mentioning is that several manufacturers, at least ones overseas, had figured out ways to use asbestos without having the, you know, uh, toxic or hazardous side effects. But this rule appears to, to prohibit that as well. So, um, again, you know, more remains to be seen, but yes, you can absolutely anticipate that there will be additional regulation and enforcement as it relates to asbestos uh, containing construction materials. All right. So I was going to ask if this will make anything harder for the construction industry. I guess, I, uh, I guess so. And that in that sense, uh, as long as it's going to be enforced that way. But it, it does sound like from what you just said, uh, there is there may be some catching up. That uh, that the the EPA need maybe need to do on this uh, on this. Yeah, you know it obviously asbestos is incredibly hazardous, dangerous material. But from a construction standpoint, amazing. Like it, it there's a reason it was used everywhere in the you know twenties through the the sixties. You know it's it is absolutely uh, an incredible construction material. So uh, if it could be rendered inert. Uh, then I, I do see where, you know, maybe a caveat or an exception could be uh, done to the EPA. What's interesting um, that we see a lot is uh, EPA regulations being disseminated down to local state agencies mm. and where a lot of uh, contractors, especially roofing contractors uh, and you know, walls and ceilings type contractors have gotten in trouble is with disposable, disposal of asbestos related materials. So we see a lot of enforcement on a local state level where the testing hasn't occurred and it's just being dumped in a regular site. And oftentimes we get dragged in to defend contractors against those agencies when that happens. I see. So uh, it's being enforced at that local level, which I guess makes, uh, makes sense. But uh, doesn't that make it more difficult, though, for contractors also operating uh, within those parameters, like, you know, if there, if there isn't one regulation to kind of follow. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, you can be, you know, a great example is, you know, you can be in Pinellas County, uh, which is, you know, St. Petersburg, Florida. They have a very robust uh, and active investigation unit that, that looks for asbestos disposal. And then you can go right next door to Hillsborough County where they've got it, but they're not as active, right? And I think it varies state by state. You can go to a place like Montana where there probably is very little regulation. You go to a place like California, you know, you're going to have a lot when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, yes, you, you, it does trickle down to a certain extent. What's interesting is I think this adds some additional layers that uh, ultimately contractors are going to have to deal with. All right. Two other thoughts on this. Uh, well, you know, one of the things that struck me when, when I saw the headline was that, you know, 
hadn't this been done already, uh, you know, being that it was 2022, I thought, you know, uh, the stance on, on asbestos was has been pretty firm uh, for decades. And also this did make, uh, this was the first right uh, rule implemented under uh, uh, that uh, Toxic Controlled Substance Act that I mentioned, which was enacted in 2016. Does it usually take that long for, for you know, a first rule like this to happen? Um, and should it take that long? <laughs> yeah, well, we're talking about the government here. So, you know, nothing nothing moves fast. And for better or worse, uh, sometimes that, that that's a good thing. Um, but I, I do think that you're going to see more out of this act. Uh, I think it's going to start to be used. I mean, asbestos is sort of a gimme. So they're probably testing the waters with that as far as getting the regulations in place to enforce it. Um, some of it is rewriting, you know, who has responsibility for what, and that was the purpose of the act originally. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, long-term, I do think that you're going to see more and more substances added to this act for purposes of regulation. Okay. Well, you know, uh, that being said about things moving or, or churning slow, uh, when it comes to government and regulation, uh, one thing that's not going slow is really this emphasis on heat and safety regulations. Uh, you know, OSHA announced late last year they were going to change how they enforced uh, the heat illness and injury standard. And now they've launched a full initiative uh, for the construction industry. What's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been watching this one closely, the heat in, and injury, uh, the new standard. Keep in mind that OSHA has always cited uh, contractors for heat injury related illness uh, under the general duty clause prior to this. But uh, there was a case that came out, an administrative decision that said that they needed a more specific rule if they wanted to really cite that. So that's what's got them on a tear to get this thing enacted. Um, obviously we're paying close attention to it. Something that people want to keep their eye on is in May, uh, beginning of May, there's a stakeholders meeting. Uh, that's a good opportunity to get your voice heard. I often travel to DC or, uh, up here on the phone to at least get my two cents in, uh, about what I think about, uh, the, the standard itself. Um, you know, obviously we want to keep our workers safe from any kind of heat related uh, injury or illness, but at the same time, I think we need to factor in the you know, if you work in certain places like Florida or Texas or New Mexico, Arizona, you know, Southern California, it's hot, right? And just because it's hot doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's unsafe to work. You have to factor in hydration. You got to factor in, you know, um, you know, ability to work in that kind of environment. Oftentimes, the heat injury and illness uh, citations that we defend are not in hot areas. They're in places like Chicago or the Northeast where workers aren't used to high heat. You know, a, a 90 degree degree uh, day here in Florida is a nice December day for us. You know, uh, up in Chicago, that would be a tough day during the summer. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're you got to add some common sense to this. And I think that's where we as an industry come into play, make sure that our voice is heard uh, at the stakeholder meeting and otherwise. Right. So other than the stakeholder meeting, is is there uh, anything the industry could or should be doing to uh, you know, slow this down a little bit? Because we're talking about regulations uh, hit, hitting this summer, right? Right, right. So we submitted a white paper a little bit earlier, um, several months ago on the issue. And I encourage you, you know, if you got thoughts, submit them, um, you know, get with your uh, your legislative contacts, whether it be uh, in the House or in the Senate. Uh, oftentimes, even though it's an administrative agency, there is some legislative oversight. You know, one of the, the champions that, that has worked closely with us has been Senator Marshall out of Kansas. Uh, he was very active during roofing day, uh, you know, was able to speak to the tile roofing uh, contractors as, as well as some other people. So uh, he has already always been uh, favorable to contractors. I encourage you to get to know these types of people that can be advocates for us up in Washington. All right. Great news there. Uh, and as we approach the heat season trend, as you said, it's always kind of a concern. Uh, are there any new recommendations uh, or, or anything you want to remind roofers uh, as they start prepping? Yeah, absolutely. So the one thing is, is remember that your safety manual is a living, breathing document, right? This is not something that you create four or five years ago and never look at it again. You need to constantly update it. And the key thing that OSHA is always looking for is to make sure that you have a culture of safety. What that means is 
you need ongoing toolbox talks, ongoing safety audits, third-party consultants, all these types of things to show that you are actually trying to get it from the top to the bottom. That's going to be the key thing if for some reason OSHA comes and knocks on your door. Got it. Okay, what else uh, are you getting calls about? So um, later tonight, I'm actually going to be speaking uh, for IBEX Southern California and RCA, the, the Roofing Association out there in Southern California. My topic is going to be the latest on uh, materials issues. And as we've talked about in, in previous uh, discussions, you know, this is, continue, is just a huge, huge impact on our industry. The, the one thing that I am spending more time on now, in fact, right before I got on here, was on a two and a half hour meeting with a surety. These sureties are really turning the screws on contractors at this point. You know, this is not um, a situation where they sit on the sideline. It, you know, one of the things that I really recommend to any roofing contractor that has a surety relationship is make sure that you are upfront, that you are actively communicating, that you're doing your best to uh, keep the surety on your side, especially in conferences that occur. Uh, with selection of counsel, all those types of things, because this materials issue and the performance bond claims that have come from it have really uh, heightened the sensitivity to sureties out there as it relates to roofing contractors. So very interesting issue. This, this is, I anticipate it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, you know, I'm seeing so many pressures out there between, you know, some additional shutdowns in, in China over COVID to the war related issues to inflation uh, that you can anticipate that there's going to be more of this type of stuff. So be proactive. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good warnings, uh, to, <laughs> to heed there, Trent. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I appreciate your insight today and, uh, all you're doing for the roofing and construction industries. Where can people find out more? Sure. Well, they can always hit me up, uh, via email at trent.cotney at arlaw.com or go to adamsandreese.com. All right. And before you check out Trent's website, while you're still on roofingcontractor.com, be sure to sign up for our free e-newsletters and a free e-news magazine so you can stay on top of the latest news and info impacting the industry. For our walls and ceilings audience, please also visit wconline.com and for, uh, for more comprehensive coverage of the interior construction trade. Stay safe and we will see you next time.